I speak to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May I speak only the truth this day, and may only the truth be perceived. Amen. Amen. As I may have alluded to in my past sermons, I am one of those modern phenomena called a latchkey kid. Both my parents worked, so when I was dropped off by the school bus, usually around 4 p.m., I was alone for probably half an hour, or an hour and a half, I should say. Living in the country and without siblings at home, I was left to my own devices for an hour and a half or so. Lots of time to get into mischief. <laughs> Thankfully, I was a fairly obedient child and I only almost burned the house down once. <laughs> so I used to arrive home and grab a snack and sit down and park myself in front of the TV. My favorite station was Channel 29 from Buffalo, for those of you who grew up around the Toronto area. At times it could be a little snowy, something we're not used to seeing in our digital world anymore, where you either have the signal or you don't. But back in the day though, you could be in this Neverland and get some or most of the signal. Sometimes you could even get the audio from one station and the video, the fuzzy video, from another, if the wavelengths drifted into each other. What I liked about Channel 29 was that after school, they would play recent repeats like Gilligan's Island, The Brady Bunch, Ponderosa, The Rifleman. But they also played older shows from the 30s and 40s like The Little Rascals with Alfalfa, Spanky and Buckwheat. And classics like Laurel and Hardy, The Three Stooges and Abbott and Costello. I was thinking of this recently and at the time those shows were about 30 or 40 years old. So in today's world, that would, be, that would mean like watching shows from the 80s and 90s. I'll let that sink in for a second, for those of you of a certain age. One of my favorite skits from this era was the famous baseball skit from Abbott and Costello. I think you can put the next slide on, Sarah. And the next one. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know who's on third. Tomorrow the pitcher, today the catcher. Why in left field? Because in center field. I don't care, the shortstop. And nobody in right field. Did everybody realize that? That the, actually the right field, right fielder doesn't have a name? It's nobody. The premise of, for those of you who have never heard it, is that baseball players all have unusual nicknames. So they were all named why, what, I don't know, tomorrow, today. And poor Lou Costello gets confused when he tries to figure out the different players of a baseball team. It was so popular for Abbott and Costello that they copyrighted the skit in 1944. And in 2005, Who's On First was included in the American Film Institute's list of the top 100 most memorable phrases. Just last week before the service, uh, Gordon and I, as we were preparing for vestry, trying to sort out who was doing what, he said, so who's on first? And I said, well, I don't know, but what's on second? <laughs> it's part of our cultural lexicon, at least for people of a certain age. I guess, Gord, you and I are of that certain age. My kids would probably have no idea what I was talking about, but most of us probably would. Our gospel reading is a similar sort of story to who's on first with lots of ironies and word plays, with Nicodemus cast in the role of the hapless Lou Costello, and Jesus more in the role of Bud Abbott. Funny, I have never thought of Jesus looking like Bud Abbott. <laughs> this passage, too, has some equally memorable biblical lines, like, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Ken and I, after the or before the service a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about what does it mean to be born again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The double entendres start right from the beginning. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a teacher of the law, comes to Jesus at night. He's a ruler, but he doesn't understand anything about the kingdom of God. 
He comes in darkness because he is in darkness. He says, we, the Pharisees, know you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. They can hear Jesus' words and see in front of their own eyes the signs and wonders of the word made flesh. Yet they have no sign of understanding of the significance of them. Jesus replies, you, meaning all of them, the whole community must be born again. The time has come for you, all of you, to stop relying on having Abraham as your father as the means of your salvation. You see, for Jews of Jesus' day, salvation was not contingent on them maintaining the daily offerings or sacrifices. This was just a means of showing their allegiance and their membership to and in the covenant. Their salvation came from their identity, their pride, as the seed of Abraham. This was the hope of their salvation. Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God is not a place for spiritual or ethnic pride, the fruit of those in Adam. The kingdom of God is a place of repentance and forgiveness. New creation, new birth, a renewal of the human heart, the fruit of the spirit of the second Adam. Instead of being a child of Abraham, being a child of God. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Greek word anathen used here is the source of the misunderstanding between Jesus and Nicodemus. You see, it can also, it can mean from above, but it also can mean again. Jesus means it one way, and Nicodemus takes it the other. Jesus means from above. Nicodemus takes it literally meaning as a born again. You know, I have a lot of sympathy for poor Nicodemus for being accused of asking perhaps the stupidest question in the Bible. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? But I don't think, after I'm doing a lot of research for this sermon this week, I don't think Nicodemus is being stupid. Although at face value it may seem that way. I think he's actually being quite wise. He is, after all, the teacher of Israel. Leon Morris, Australian New Testament scholar and Anglican priest, writes, and I think that it's on the slide there. This is a fairly long uh, quote, so I'll, I'll read it for you. It is perhaps more likely that he, Nicodemus, is wistful rather than obtuse. A man, Nicodemus might have said, is the sum of all his yesterdays. He is the man he is today because of all the things that have happened to him throughout the years. He is a bundle of doubts and uncertainties, wishes, hopes, fears, and habits, good and bad, built up through the years. It would be wonderful to break the entail of the past and make a completely fresh beginning, but how can this possibly be done? Can physical birth be repeated? Since this lesser miracle is quite impossible, how can we envisage, envisage a greater miracle, the remaking of a person's essential being? Regeneration is a sheer impossibility. And then Jesus expounds a little more on it. Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This may sound straightforward, like Jesus is clarifying the previous sentence, but these words, once again, are multi-layered. The word for spirit, pneuma, can also mean wind. And the reference to water can mean many things. It can represent purification, possibly a reference to the baptism of repentance of John. Scripture is clear, though, that the Pharisees refused John's baptism. That's in Luke chapter 7, verse 30. Is this what Jesus is asking of Nicodemus? If so, it would be quite a, hur a hurdle as a Pharisee. But water and similar words, such as rain, 
dew and drop in the second temple period were also used of male reproductive fluid, the seed, the life-giving potential. An illusion that Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a teacher, would have been used to. Being born of water and the Spirit is thus a reference to the life-giving potential of the Spirit of God. Or as Morris puts it, the miracle that takes place when the divine activity remakes anyone. Jesus then continues, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Just as the wind is mysterious and unpredictable, we all, all lived through the Dureco this last summer. So too are those whose life is animated by the Spirit of God. It seems to have come, it seems to have come from nowhere. We all know someone, perhaps even our very selves, who have been touched by God's Spirit and in a flash become a different person, a new creation. As Paul writes in his first letter, letter to the Corinthians, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Friends, we live in a time of transition right now in the church in the West. Like the analog television stations of my youth, on a hot summer day where we see the snowy video of one station and hear the audio of another. We live in a time where the same words in the same places mean different things to different people. We live in a time when orthodox Christian belief and practice infused by scripture and the faith handed, handed down to us by the apostles is being supplanted in some churches by progressive Christianity as those churches become soaked in the culture around us. And the main way that this is informed is through something called critical theory. We're getting into the weeds here a little bit. That's a golf term, right? Right, Dave, isn't it? Yeah. Critical theory and Christianity both have a goal of justice, but it's a different kind of justice. It's a different worldview, a different narrative, a different gospel. But like the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus, the same words are used, but they mean different things. The Bible story starts with creation. It anchors us in God a holy, good, and loving God as creatures, male and female. The progressive story doesn't start with creation. There is no answer to the question, who are we? There is no transcendent design or purpose to our lives. We exist primarily in relation to other people. We define who we are based on whatever marker we want to be used our sex, our race, our class, our gender, the list is infinite. To answer Costello's question, who's on first? The answer is me. The next question we have to ask is about the fall. What is our core fundamental problem as human beings? The Bible tells us our problem is sin, rebellion against God. Scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But progressive religion tells us that our main problem is oppression, power, domination, and the haves and have-nots. It is the patriarchy, whiteness, Christianity, I'm going to stumble over this one, but heteronormativity, cisgenderism, toxic masculinity, the nuclear family. Whatever is perceived as being dominant is considered oppressive. 
This is why woke culture is so intent on destroying the family. Several years ago, after I was ordained a deacon, before I really truly knew anything about this, I heard some buzzwords and stuff, but I really didn't understand it. I took a selfie of me wearing a clerical collar. I was proud of having a clerical collar on. And I shared it with the kids in our family group chat. And this is what I wrote with the photo. Finally, I am the ultimate oppressor, a white married male clergyman with children. I wrote it as a joke, and I think I kind of had a stupid look on my face too, because I didn't believe it to be true, and I still don't. I am a sinner redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Full stop. The Bible tells us that the answer to our rebellion is Jesus, who died in our place, paid the penalty for our sins to rescue us. We need to repent of our sin, how we have fallen short of reflecting God's image into creation and our rejection of God's wise and just rule. We need to trust in Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross and allow the Spirit to change us, to be born again, to be born from above. But progressive religion tells us that we need to become woke. We need to wake up to how we oppress people to repent of our privilege, whatever that might be. We need to be, become activists to raise awareness, to tear down and change structures that keep people oppressed. Our primary moral duty is not to love God, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to love God with all our heart and mind, strength and spirit. It is to work for the liberation of the oppressed, so that we can live in a state of equity. Instead of sorrow, repentance, forgiveness, leading to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, and faithfulness, it is guilt and anger, for there is never forgiveness, as nobody can ever do enough to atone for their perceived sins of privilege, power, and abuse of power. Ultimately, it's a gospel of death, not life. If someone has something that you don't, the thinking goes, they must have used their privilege and power to take money from you to buy it. It is therefore your moral responsibility to steal it back, to take it. Material abundance is no longer seen as a sign of God's blessing. It is seen as a symbol of the abuse of power. Is it just me, or does that sound kind of twisted? The goal of progressive religion is utopia, utopia, equity, which we can accomplish in our own power if we just try hard enough. The goal of Christianity is the kingdom of God, the utopia that can only be accomplished when Jesus is all in all, and he hands over the kingdom to the Father. A time when the whole of creation, us included, is redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The justice of one is not the justice of the other. My brothers and sisters, I'm saying all of this because progressive Christianity seems to be on the ascendancy. Denominations that we would assume would be immune to this sort of thinking are, are capitulating. Recently, in 2019, the Southern Baptist Convention in the U.S., by all accounts, a very socially conservative group indeed passed a resolution stating that critical race theory and intersectionality could be employed as an analytical tool subordinate to scripture. Just to put this in perspective, this is a denomination that 60 years ago was generally very much against the civil rights movement in the US. It's easy to get sucked in. If you aren't paying attention, you begin using the same words, and the meaning of those words change without you even recognizing it. One commentator wrote about critical theory, and I think this is on the, on the slides there for everybody. It outwardly seems and seeks to do good, but in reality seems determined to do harm. 
It is the proverbial Trojan horse that rides along with well-intended people of goodwill, even in the church, but sooner or later infiltrates and destroys all it touches. Ultimately, it's a lie. And we all know who the father of lies is. And the saddest part of it all is that it leaves people in their sins. It falsely says you're okay when you're actually heading to eternal judgment. This past month and indeed this past week has been a watershed moment in, for the Anglican Communion. This may sound like a little inside baseball for you. Do you get that? Do you get the baseball analogy? It's a little thread going through the whole sermon. It's good, eh? That came from him, not me. In February, the Church of England General Synod passed a resolution allowing the blessing of same-sex unions. It's not changed its canons, stating that marriage is still between a man and a woman, but it will allow the blessing of civilly recognized same-sex unions. This proposal was put forward by the bishops of the Church of England after a six-year consultation and discussion entitled, entitled Living in Love and Faith, or LLF. It was commissioned to study the issue of sexuality and the church in the modern era. The motion passed, but a sizable percentage, 42%, were not in favor of the motion. This comes after a fiasco of the Lambeth Conference this, last, this past summer, the once per decade gathering of bishops from all over the Anglican Communion that has assembled roughly, roughly every decade at Lambeth Palace since 1867. Some have said that this was probably the last Lambeth conference. You see, this was the conference that was supposed to bring us all together as Anglicans, united in a common mission to preach Jesus to a broken world, to heal the divisions that has plagued us in the Anglican communion since the apostasy of the Western churches first came to light in the early 2000s. I think we all here know what I'm talking about. Yet the Lambeth Conference only deepened these divisions with the Archbishop of Canterbury, the first among equal, equals in the Anglican Communion, telling delegates that there are two truths, one for the West and one for the rest. As a result of this, one group within the Anglican Communion, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans, composed predominantly of Anglicans in the global south, Africa, Asia, South America, but also uh, the Anglican Church in North America and the Diocese of Sydney in Australia are members or affiliates. Now this may sound small, may sound large, but it actually is large. It represents 60 of the 80 million Anglicans in the world, 75% of the worldwide Anglican communion in terms of numbers. So the GFSA stepped up to the plate. Did you get that? Baseball again? <laughs> yes. Who stepped up? The GFSA did. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, now I lost my spot. <laughs> stepped up to the plate. There we go. With this most recent vote at General Synod, they, they the GFSA, uh, GSFA, passed a, or released a press statement on February 20, 20th, and they stated themselves in a state of impaired communion with the Mother Church, the Church of England, just like the Anglican Church of Canada and the Episcopal Church in the USA, stating that the Church of England had left the communion, not the other way around. Indeed, they state that the Church of England had disqualified herself from leading the communion. They no longer recognize the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the authority of the See of Canterbury, the historic home of Anglicanism as being first among equals. The center of gravity of the Anglican Communion is finally shifting from England to the global south. Anchored not in the institutions, the so-called instruments of unity, but in Jesus. They have made it known 
that they will provide Episcopal oversight to those Anglican churches in England who wish to remain faithful in the midst of existing in a revisionist province. I watched a YouTube video of a vicar from, from uh, England and he was commenting on this and he said, he said it's strange now, he said, in England you can either choose to be part of the Church of England or you can choose to be an Anglican. That's the way they look at it right now, or he at least looks at it right now. The GSFA are working diligently to reset the communion and to ensure that the reset is marked by reform and renewal. And this press release was signed by 12 archbishops, including our own. I'm gonna sound like a used car salesman, but wait, it gets better. This past week, the leadership of St. Helens Bishopsgate, a conservative evangelical parish, indeed the largest parish church within the city of London, and one of the largest churches in the Church of England, dating back to 1210, the home church of William Shakespeare when he was in London, a survivor of not only the dissolution of the monasteries, but the Great Fire of London in 1666, and the Blitz, has declared itself in impaired communion with its own diocese, the Diocese of London. And they state, and I think this, uh, there's a quote up here too. This is what the, this is what the, uh, the rector, the Re Reverend William Taylor said. We believe that this failure of the House of Bishops to uphold God's teaching on marriage and sexuality requires a clear and public distinction between ourselves and those who, by their words and actions, deny the authority of God's word and walk away from the teaching of the Lord Jesus. The bishops of the Church of England have walked away from us. By contrast, we will continue to walk in closer union with those who have told the teaching of God's word and will actively develop stronger gospel partnerships with them. As an indication of this, they are withholding their financial contributions from the diocesan coffers. They're playing hardball. See, there's another one. <laughs> and in the short term, our own Archbishop Foley Beach will be providing Episcopal oversight for the congregation in the short term. Suffice it to say that the meeting that Sarah and I are attending in Rwanda, the GAFCON meeting, GAFCON and G GSFA work kind of in partnership with one another. The meeting that Sarah and I are going to in Rwanda in a little over a month should be very interesting to say the least. My brothers and sisters, this is huge. We are on the cusp of being not the other Anglican church in Canada, in North America, but the Anglican church in Canada. The one that is recognized by the global Anglican communion. Over these past 15 or so years, the tables are finally turning. Thanks to the courage and conviction of Anglicans around the world. We are not alone, even though we sometimes feel it. I believe our long period of faithfully, patiently waiting on the Lord is bearing fruit all in the Lord's time. As our psalm says this morning, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Friends, I hope I'm not appearing overly gleeful over this. Honestly, it breaks my heart. The state of the church that I love, that I grew up in. But I would rather be in a bare room full of people who love and worship Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit and preach the power of the cross than in a beautiful building that is a cold stone edifice to a time long past. A place where sin is rebellion. A place where re repentance is accepted and forgiveness is given and redemption 
is eternal. To be amongst a people that proclaim, proudly proclaim with a loud shout, Jesus, when asked who's on first. Amen. Amen.